what is it that got you through the five or six years you were actually in prison? What, what gave you okay. the hope to hang on? Okay, what, what, what happened to me was, is after three months up there, okay, there's no good answers. There's no good answer for this thing unless you turn to God, to prayer. Okay, there's just no good answer. Now, I was a very strong man. I thought that I could handle anything, you know, and so on. After three months up there, just give you a couple of thoughts, I, I said to myself, I said to myself, you don't believe this, how bad it is. Your mind just completely goes against, above the situation, you know. You, your mind goes above the situation and you're withdrawn. It's like you're, you're watching a dream or something, okay. It's, it's such a horror story. Your mind just rejects it, okay. So I said, okay, you don't believe that you're here. You don't believe this. You know, your mind will accept this. So I said, okay, now, it looked like we're never going to get out of there the rest of our lives. We're going to die up there. So I remember saying to myself, okay, now remember, if you ever get out of here, remember this, okay? Mm -hmm. So you can never get upset with anyone that you explain it to and that don't understand it mm -hmm. if you get out of here. Because you lived it for three months and you didn't believe it. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's how bad it is, all right? Now, the other thing I thought around that time was is that I wonder if God's up here, okay? Mm -hmm. And I thought, I answered my own question. This wasn't a prayer. You know, I said, I wonder if I have that. No, he, he wouldn't be up here. It's too filthy, too, too vicious, too cruel, too evil. It's just sheer evil. This is just unbelievable. Okay? He wouldn't be up here. You can't ask God to be here. And then I thought, again, if I ever get out of here, I bet he picks us up on the way home. I'll pick God picks us up on the way home. Okay? I tell you that because... That's the lack of faith I had. You see how that places where my faith is? I thought God was, you know, I've been to a Catholic school and I've been going to church and everything like that, but I believed God was handling the big things and he would never actually get involved in our everyday life. You know what I'm saying? I just, I just had no faith like that. I had no faith like that. Now, I believe because of that question, that honest question I had, over the next year or so, he revealed to me that you know, he was totally in charge, controlling the ants, the spiders in the camp, that he was totally in charge in the communist prison camp. The communists weren't in charge. Okay. Mm. We obviously weren't in charge, but the communists weren't either. Okay. Mm. It was God. You know, God was in charge. Okay. Now, that's what, that's what he revealed to me. That's why I say it's the best thing that ever happened to me. Uh, because of the hatred and all that kind of thing, I, you know, because of the torture and killing Sai John and everything, I developed tremendous hatred. You know, over like six months or so, I had tremendous hatred. Okay, now hatred is the worst of all sins. There's no sin worse than hatred. This is Satan. You're playing with Satan, but I didn't know that. Okay, I didn't understand. He wrote me into the, with these things. The pride that I had, the tremendous pride that I had, resulted in anger when I was terribly humiliated, and that's dangerous. And then you get into anger and hatred. Okay, and because of the pride, I get the anger, the hatred. I rebel against this. This humiliation, this terrible humiliation, and I try to. I, I now, for the first time in my life, I want to get even with these guys. I want. I'm vituperative. They call it. You want to get even, okay? So I have literally. I have in my mind a list of 22, 22 separate torture lists for twenty-two different interrogators and torturers. Okay. That, and I, and my take is is when I get, if I ever get out of here to come back in kidnap these guys, bring them back in the jungle, and never let them die under these things. Okay? And like they did them. us under torture. Okay, never let them die, you know, and keep them in that agony, you know, day and night after day and night after day and night, okay? So that's how bad it was. Now, this is sheer hatred. So then I start getting suicidal thoughts, like, you know, go over in the corner and stop eating, which keeps them from getting any propaganda from you, right? Well, that's suicide. So luckily I had a nun, you know, early 50s, Baltimore Catechism, you know, beat the lessons into us with the side of a yardstick and so on, you know, <laughs> excellent teaching method. But one of the things she'd tell us is, is that, you know, suicide is sheer cowardice and quitting, okay? You want that to be your legacy for all your family? You want to be a coward? Then commit suicide. You want to be a quitter? Commit suicide. There's no excuse for suicide, ever. You'd be a, you'd be a quitter forever and a coward forever in heaven, even if you make it, if you're lucky enough to make it. So, I knew that this, these, so my take on it was, I mean, you know, Satan is so clever, you know. I'm totally blinded to the fact that I'm sitting with the worst sin in the world, hatred. So I, I, but I knew that thought. I said, this is not God. This is obviously not God. So how does this happen? I'm not sinning. I'm not doing anything wrong. You know what? 
So then, because, again, my, my mother and my aunt started praying the rosary for me every day when I was shot down and bombed, and vowed to say that rosary until, I, until they both died, which they both did. Mm. Wow. Okay? God let me see, you know, that this was suicide, I couldn't do it, and that, uh, that I'm, you know, I'm getting, I, I've got I've to stop the hatred, that the hatred is a problem. That's why I'm getting mm. suicidal thoughts. That's why I say, if you ever see a kid... Uh, committing suicide or soldiering it's because he's hating somebody. Be careful, you know. That's that's when that's when I got that suicide stuff. Okay, yeah. you know, like these kids get in a sexual relationship and they break up and somebody's really mad, you know, and then they get the suicidal yeah. thoughts. And that's yeah. I'm convinced because yeah. they start hating each yeah. other. You know, love turns into hate yeah. and so on. At any rate, that's what happened to me. I had the suicidal thoughts. Now, so I said, okay, I'm going to stop the hatred. Couldn't stop the hatred all night long, all day long while I'm doing this. Thing. Then this is, I said, I'm going to stop the hatred. I'm a slave to the sin. Mm. This is a slavery that Jesus came for. Okay? I'm a slave to the habit, to the, to the sin, to the vice. I'm a slave. I'm a slave. And I'm strong. And I can. And I got willpower. And I can't stop it. So, in the prison camp, I get on my knees and I said, Jesus, I can't stop this. I can't stop this. Please help me if you're there. You know, help me. Help me. Stop this. I've got to stop this hatred. I understand. Because the suicidal thoughts get stronger and stronger, you know. It's almost like they're picking you up and pulling you in the corner. You know? So I said, I said, uh, please help me if you can, and so on. I started praying over and over again, the rosary and prayers, to, to keep my mind out of the hatred. After three months, for the first time, I could form in my mind the words, Lord, forgive him. Mm -hmm. wow. In my mind. I couldn't say it, mm -hmm. but I could form it in my mind the first time. But I didn't mean it. <laughs> <laughs> but three more months, and I'm, and I'm praying, Lord, forgive him. I understand they're your children. You love them as much as me. You know, I understand they're under mm -hmm. orders. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I hope you forgive them. I hope you get them to heaven. Okay? And I meant it. And the last three or three and a half years of my life, I had tremendous joy and peace in my heart. Yeah. I've never been as happy or joyful or peaceful in my whole life since. Okay? Because I had all that prayer every day. Mm -hmm. You know? And I was praying for the enemies. I was praying for my enemies, you know, all the time. I really was, you know. And so I had tremendous joy and peace in my heart. So, and, I, and also, about as that all happened, he started showing me that he had total control over everything going on. And uh, I'll just tell you a torture story or two here to show you an idea. He saved me from torture. He prevented torture. He did all kinds of things after that. After, he was, after I was praying hard, he, he revealed himself to me every day, many, many times. Every day I'm going through life. i got a smile on my face. It's unbelievable. I got knocked across a faith with a two-by-four. In the guard, because he hated it, because I was smiling all the time. Couldn't stand me being happy. You know? So, <clears throat> at any rate, I'm brought into a interrogation for uh, meeting the delegations. This was a great fear. After about a year, it's my turn. They breach you and bring bring you in. This is to me a delegation, a liberal delegation, communist-loving delegation from the United States, but most of them were from Europe. Okay, but we had some fellow travelers here in the states too. But you know, most of them were European. But the delegations would come in, so they would torture a POW till he agreed to answer these questions at the communist line. We shouldn't be in Vietnam. We're killing a lot of civilians. Da 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 da. -da. Okay, he'd, he'd agree to answer the questions a certain way. Then they'd give the list of questions to their delegation. Then they, and then you got a camera on it. Then they read it, the, the questions, and then the POW would give these tortured answers. Okay. Then they'd play it on CNN or you know BBC yeah. and so on. Now, how would any of you guys like to do that? Okay. How would you like to do it? How would you like to be a traitor on international TV? Mm. Well, we didn't either. You know, we're mm. fighting these guys. Okay? Mm. And after you've been through torture a while, you know they can get you to do it. Okay? And you watch guy after guy do it. You know? Okay? No problem. You know, I, the, the, the standard torture for meeting the delegations was is they tie you up with your elbows tying, touching behind your back. Elbows mm. tying. Typically that dislocates one of your shoulders. Mm. You know, they, they tie you really tight around here, really tight around here, and they take those two ropes and they bring them together until your elbows are touching. Try touching your elbows behind your back. They touch your elbows behind your back, okay? And they put leg uh, ankle irons on your ankles, and they sit you down, they take these arms, these arms, extend them up high, over your back, down almost to your ankles, okay? Tie the, tie the, doesn't cost them any effort, tie the arms down to the ankle irons. Leave you like that. They untie it twice a day to take the bread and water. Mm. They want you to die. Tie it back out. You know, you're under shackles and so on. Mm. They leave you like that, you know, day and night, 24 hours a day. Mm. Okay? Mm. Now, if you still don't, after, you know, a week or so, mm -hmm. if you still don't do anything, then they take the rope from the uh, elbows, 
and they hang it from a fang hook. Mm. Now you're hanging by your oh. arms from behind oh. your back, hanging from a fan hook. You know, 24-7, mm. forever. forever. So it happened to John McCain? Yeah, he yeah, got, he got the, hanging, the hanging torture by the yeah. fan hook. So yeah. anyway, what, what basically what they do is they have a way to torture you. You know, eventually you say, okay, I'll do it. Then they leave you hanging for another half a day or so. Just so you don't fight them so readily the next time and so on, you know. Of course, we did. We tried to. But, I mean, the basic idea is this is what they do. So after you've been through this a while, you realize they can get me to meet these delegations. So it's a terror. That's one of the reasons that suicide sounds good. Because, you know, you know you're going to, mm -hmm. they can make you a traitor. So after a year, it was my turn. So the camp commander calls me in and I'm being uh, um, interrogated through an interpreter. And the camp commander said, and, and the only reason I made a year before they went after me, is because when they first when we first got down there, they asked Craner and I what we thought of the war and you know and what we thought of the bombing and so on. We gave totally hardline answers. You know, war's a good war. War we're trying to defend South Vietnam. Uh, you know, we're bombing North Vietnam, just military targets to try to keep the supplies going in the South. And I forget the third question, but hard luck. I figured, you know, I figured that that uh, and I, I I made up the answers and they were really hard line. And Craner said, "What'd you write?" And I said, "Here." He says, all right, I'll do the same. So the two of us stuck together. So we were, you know, unrepentant criminals, you know. Okay. So that saved us. That put us at the end of the line for the meeting of delegations. Because I thought it would put us at the first of the line. I thought they were going to kill us. I thought, you know, all this kind of stuff. But it's just the opposite. See, they're bureaucrats. They're trying to get people. They're trying to get a job done. Their government's telling them, get these people to meet the delegations. Well, who are you going to pick to meet a delegation? Somebody that's hardline or somebody that's a wishy-wash? Okay? Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to pick the wishy-wash. I mean, looking back on it, but of course, we're so young. We're just so young. We don't understand about bureaucracy, and they got to check off what they're doing, and you know, all this kind of... Now I understand it, but I didn't understand it when I was that age. But anyway, it was the best thing we ever could have done, because they left us alone for the delegations for a year. But after a year, they said, hey, we didn't get these guys to meet a delegation. So they call me in first, and they put me in the... Uh, Interrogation, the camp commander says, we want you to read on the speaker. That's the first thing they do. They have you read on the speaker, the news, the news of South Vietnam. So uh, I said, no, I don't want to read on the speaker. He said, no, it's good for you. We've let you send a letter home to your wife, you know, tell that you're alive and so on. And we'll give you, you know, if she writes back, we give you a letter back. Good for you. I wasn't allowed to write a letter to my wife for the first two and a half years. But this is after a year, and, you know, they're saying, and meanwhile, they're telling me, you know, your wife's running around and she's remarried, you know, all this kind of thing. So, uh, I said, no, I don't want to do that, you know. So he said, no, you must do it. It's a camp regulation, you know. I'm the camp commander, you know, you've got to do what we say. No, I don't. He said, no, oh, you'll be punished. We're punish you. Punish is our code word for torture, right? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, I understand, I understand, you know. So I was just taking away, you know. So they put me in the ropes and the irons in the torture room. And about eight hours later, they bring me back into the interrogation. The camp commander's here with the interrogator. This is the end of the day. He says, you don't want to read on our speaker. I said, no, no. He said, why don't you want to read this paper? I just don't want to read on it. He says, but you, you, uh, no treason. It's just, you read news, news. It's no bad, no bad. Why wouldn't you do that? I said, I just don't want to. He says, no, why not? Why don't you want to read on it? You know? And so out of nowhere, this was not my idea. I never thought of this at all. Never came up, you know, never understood this, okay. That just, I said, inspired, I believe. I said, because it would disgrace my family. Mm. So he says, no, take them back. So they put me back in the torture. An hour later, they come, they undo everything, and bring me back to the cell. <laughs> I, I, oh this is the only God. person that got God. out of this. So I come back to the cell. Craner says, what are you doing back? Yeah. You know, breaking in one day, you know. So I said, I don't know, Bob. You know, he says, did you read on the speaker? I said, heck no. He says, well, you know, what's, what's going on? Jeez, we must be going to. Go home. <laughs> and that's what I thought. That's what I, this was so out of everything. But this is God doing this, okay? Another time, and so he, I never had to go through that. I never had to meet that. The thing that I really was so scared about, being a traitor on national TV, I never had to be. Okay? So that's number one. Number two, and that was all God. All God. That was his set up and that was his words you know i'm convinced you know this guy they respect the family a lot over there and that's probably the one thing that could have come out of my mouth that would get me out of that you know okay the other thing was is that i was in with an interrogator one of the really uh, bad ones and uh, a name that we called him i can't say in polite company. <laughs> but anyway i'm in with him and so he's going through the interrogation 
questions of this particular line of questioning that they go through with all 50 of us in this camp. So the, the, the line is today, he starts out with, you should be very thankful to the government for giving you food and keep you alive. A lot of men die, but you have food and you're living, you know, and stuff like that. I said, I thank God for the food. You know, he said, what? No, no, government is God. Government is God. You know, government gives you food. You know, we give you the shelter for the rain, the monsoon. We give you food. We give you. We keep you alive. You know, stuff like that. You should be thankful to the Politburo, to the government, stuff like that. Okay, so I no, no, I thank God. See, God has a seed. Does the government have a seed? No, government has no seeds. And, you know, the sun, the rain, you know, the soil. You know, you know how things grow. Food grows. That's God. I thank God for the food. Okay, government didn't do that. You know, government gets it from the people that grow and give it here. That's fine, but it's God. So I thank God for the food. No, 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 no. This, uh, this, this time, you know, he says, you know, God is government, you know, and so on and so forth. Anyway, this deteriorates after 10 or 15 years. I'm trying to evangelize this guy. Okay? Now I'm a believer. Now I know that God's all important. So this has got me my first guy that I persuade. So I pick a guy that I didn't persuade. So I'm, but I'm trying to do my best. And so after, but I have no, I have no debate training. I have no persuasion training. I'm not a priest, not a minister, you know. I'm just a dumb, you know. You know, my idea of winning an argument is to be louder and, you know, talk more than the other guy and then you win the argument, you know, that kind of stuff. So anyway, I didn't, I wasn't winning this thing. So at any rate, after 10 or 15 minutes, I say, I'm saying things to him. Look, when you die, you know, it's going to be Jesus Christ on one side of the table, you on the other. Okay, that's what it's going to be like. And Cy John's death and all these other people you're killing and all this pain is going to be on a torture, on the, on the table. Now, I know you can't stop this. I know you're under orders. I know you've got to keep doing this, okay? But after you're done doing it, you've got to be sorry before you die. Otherwise, you're going to go to hell. Jesus, there's going to be no politics there. You're going to go to hell. Okay? You're going to burn forever. And it's really out. So he goes absolutely nuts. Okay? So he's bouncing off the wall. And I mean screaming at the top of his lungs. i got five thugs on me. And they start bringing me out to the hot box. Ringing in my ears as I leave that little interrogation room is, you know, I will show you, you will have nothing without the government, nothing, do you hear me, you will have nothing, nothing, you will have nothing without the government, nothing, over and over again. He's totally lost it, okay? So they bring me out to the hot box, there's no doors or windows in it, you got to step in a hatch. So I'm stepping in the hatch in the hot box, it's 11 o'clock in the morning, you know, it's an August morning, it's very hot in Vietnam. So I'm stepping in there, and one of these guards reaches over and picks up a piece of stiff cardboard off the ground of the prison yard, makes a fanning motion with it, and gives it to me. Oh. I've got, uh, you're going to have nothing ringing in your rear. I've got a fan. <laughs> <laughs> I, I step in a hot box. I can't believe it. You know, to me, because my big thing is, is God had deserted me for my pathetic attempt at evangelization. Of this. <laughs> I was seriously concerned about that. I figured, boy, you blew that. I mean, this guy's never going to listen to anybody again. You know, obviously you can't. Be, you know, persuading is not to be loud, and, and you, you can't do that. You can't. Get, you got to be persuasive. You can't. Obviously, you're doing it all wrong. And oh, God is all I had. But now with a fan, I knew that you know he he, he at least forgiven me for you know my stupid attempt. <laughs> so I'm on my knees, and I'm really honestly, uh, as divine mercy, three o'clock every afternoon, set divine mercy. Yeah. 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 At any rate, the. Um, uh, I'm, I'm on my knees and I'm literally, the fan's on the ground, I don't care about the fan. I'm sweating like a pig, but I've got tremendous tears of joy coming down my eyes. Yeah. Tremendous warmth. Best I ever had in my heart. Tremendous warmth in my chest, okay? You know, God's right there with me, you know? And I'm saying over and again, thank you, God. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, God. Thank you, Mary. Just enjoy. Tremendous smile. I'm so happy, okay? Five minutes go by as there's thunder in the distance. Thirty minutes later, a two inches of rain fall on that camp and cool that hot box off. They take me out and put me on my knees, but that was the end of that. Now, the lesson to that for me, and always has been, is, is that he gave me a favor giving me that fan, and I thanked him for that. Okay? But I, that's, that wasn't going to be any real relief. But I thanked him for that favor. Okay? And he gave me the real favor, which was to get that off my back. Okay, and I swear it works like that, and everything in life. If you can just learn to say thank you every day for what's happening, mm -hmm. you know, then His blessings just He multiplies them. He just does one thing after another type of thing. Thank you. Thank you.